for justice. Aram Sir Justin McNulty. I call Justin McNulty. Question number one, Madam Deputy Speaker. Registering reoffending is central to the work of my department. A wide range of organisations, including the Police Service of Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Prison Service, the Youth Justice Agency and the Probation Board, work collaboratively to provide rehabilitative programmes, supervision and support which focus on addressing the factors which lead to offending behaviour. In 2013, my department published the Strategic Framework for Reducing uh, Offending. The framework recognised the need for strong partnership working across government and with the statutory, voluntary and community sector, both to prevent people from becoming involved in crime and to reduce reoffending. We will continue to build on the core principles set out in the strategic framework through my department's contributions to the draft programme for Government 1621, which contains a performance indicator focusing on reducing reoffending. The associated delivery plan is currently out for public consultation and consideration will be given to how best we can take forward the, the respective actions therein. The programme for Government will be the main vehicle through which my department will work to deliver strategic actions aimed at pre preventing reoffending. Consequently, I do not have any current plans to bring forward a separate strategy, although I will keep this under review. Just a McNulty for supplementary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Uh, as the Minister will know, the Welsh Government have a strategy to prevent real offending, which involves police, agencies and government, addressing priority offenders groups, reducing real offending across health, education, substance misuse, debt, can, related, can the related crime, abuse. Is this integrated approach and a dedicated strategy not needed in the North? I thank the, the member for his supplementary and in, indeed in respect of the answer that I gave him to the original question I think it outlines that that collaborative approach is one which we're taking within Northern Ireland indeed we need to have a collaborative approach when it comes to reducing reoffending. offending um, if, if we can enable um, offenders to, uh, once they come out of custody to go back into a safer community not just for themselves but indeed for the entire community so indeed that collaborative working is, is at the heart of, of my Justice Department's uh, work and indeed at the heart of the programme for government. I call Doug Beatty. Uh, I thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and I thank the Minister for uh, questions so, so far. And it's, it's quite clear, but if I can expand the, uh, the issue of, of crime. Um, as you know, the Northern Ireland Crime Survey is showing a decrease in crime, yet the PSNI crime statistics are showing an increase of crime. Could you give us a view on that and where resources would go to? Um, I, I think the member uh, raises a very interesting point in terms of the measurement of crime and indeed is that a, a measurement um, or an appropriate measurement in terms of how we tackle some of the issues that we're facing uh, within the criminal justice system. Indeed um, one of my key priorities as the member will be familiar is around domestic violence. Um, you know, Arguably, if we have a reducing crime in that, that would suggest that um, it's decreased reporting. So we would like to see an increase in reporting, which would suggest an increase in crime. So I think um, we have to take a number of factors into account when we look at crime statistics um, and see how we can best tackle these issues based on those, on those numbers. I call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, would the Minister uh, join with me in welcoming the appointment of Cheryl Lamont as the Chief Executive of the Preparation Board in Northern Ireland? And that's the type of organisation we need to continue um, to support to prevent reoffending. Um, um, entirely, um, and I was delighted to hear um, of Cheryl's appointment. Indeed, I wrote to her uh, very soon after um, hearing of the outcome of that. Um, I've worked with Sh Cheryl uh, in her role acting up in that uh, since becoming minister, and I've been deeply impressed by her approach to uh, probation in Northern Ireland. And the probation board in itself, you know, cannot be underestimated in the work they do, both um, whilst in custody, but then following custody uh, when when people come out into the community. And indeed, it's, it is an organisation that we need to support. Um, it, there's two strands in terms in terms of uh, rehabilitation, it's preparing the, the individual themselves, but also preparing the environment in which they come out into. Um, we need to ensure that the, the proper provisions are in place so that they can be in the most stable environment so that they are unlikely to offend again. Aram Sir Pachi, and I call Pachi. I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. And uh, will she give a commitment to uh, bringing forward proposals? for uh, achievable outcomes and much needed support for uh, real offenders before, during uh, and after they leave prison. 
I uh, thank the member for his question. Indeed, I think in a previous response to the, the member, I had outlined my keenness to, to look at offending um, both you know, uh, at the point of coming into the criminal justice system, perhaps before they go into custody, during uh, their time in custody, and, they, and then indeed when, what, what, when they come out of custody. Ultimately, you know, uh, our, our aim is to ensure a safer community, and we do that uh, in the hope that no one will reoffend again. And there's a number of uh, approaches that we can take in terms of that. We've already outlined the work at the probation board and how they can help. But it has to be a wider approach than that. It has to, indeed, it has to be a cross-departmental approach. It's not just about uh, reducing the, the opportunities to, to commit a particular crime. It's about providing uh, the right social housing, for example. It's about ensuring that they have uh, the right benefits in place so that when they do come out, they won't have those opportunities. So there's a number of approaches to this, but no, I entirely agree that it has to, um, our support in terms of rehabilitation has to be at the point of the criminal justice system. Indeed, I had a conversation with the Lord Chief Justice around that very aspect. It has to be whilst they're in custody so that we can build them up and hopefully ensure that they won't reoffend. And then it has to be after in the community to, to ensure that, 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 that they're supported and that communities are kept safe. I call William Humphreys. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number two. I want to say at the outset that, out, outset that I find any attack on any symbolic building unacceptable. I'm aware that there have been a number of attacks on symbolic premises across Northern Ireland, some of which have been investigated as hate crimes by the PSNI. The, option, the operational response to such attacks is a matter for the Chief Constable, and I understand that the PSNI has a control strategy to deal with such attacks, which entail PSNI patrols continuing to pay attention to symbolic buildings and local crime prevention officers providing security advice. In response to the recent attacks in Orange Halls, the PSNI have refreshed and recirculated their control stra strategy to all districts. From the perspective of my department, the underlying societal issues that can culminate in any hate crimes, including attacks in Orange Halls, cannot be dealt with by the criminal justice system alone. They will require an, an executive-wide response if they are to be tackled effectively. The Executive Office leads on tackling hate and intolerance in society more widely through the Executives Together Building a United Community Strategy. My department supports this work through the delivery of the Executive Community Safety Strategy, which contains a commitment to tackle all forms of hate through prevention, awareness and education. I recently met with uh, Junior Ministers Fearn and Ross to discuss how my department could further support the work they are taking forward to tackle hate. Uh, crime engagement between our um, departments continues. Um, for example, in the members constituency, North Belfast District Policing and Community Safety Partnerships recently launched the No Hate Here initiative, which aims to engage the community in standing up to hate crime and to provide safe places for victims of hate crime. William Humphrey, sir, for a supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for her answer so far. Minister Orange holds with the very first community halls. They are used by hundreds of community organisations every week. Thousands of people attend them. I understand from Grand Lodge of Ireland, 32 halls have been attacked this year. The detection rate is deplorable, if not non-existent. What more can be done? Question, and will please? the Minister commit to meet with me and the Grand Lodge of Ireland delegation to discuss this issue about these appalling and ongoing attacks in the Orange community across Northern Ireland? More than happy to, to, to meet with uh, the member and the representatives uh, from, from the Orange Lodge. Indeed, um, um, I'm happy um, that I'm pleased that the member has a focus on this particular area. Indeed, during last question time, we talked about the Jewish attacks. So um, perhaps we could arrange a day where we could meet with a number of your um, representatives in, in North Belfast. But yes, more than happy to do that. I call Richie McPhillips. Thank you. Uh, let me first of all begin by condemning all hate-filled attacks, let them be in orange halls, GAA or other sporting bodies, or indeed places of worship in other places. But given that there are eight hate-motivated incidents reported to police daily, do you as Minister support the Single Equality Act as a mechanism to put in law better protection for all our citizens, including ethnic minorities? <clears throat> I thank the member for his question. Indeed, I you know, uh, condemn any form of hate attack you know, in, in any part of our society, indeed from any background. Um, I very much support the principle of equality in, in terms of what we can do within this assembly. Um, I think I demonstrated that yesterday in terms of uh, the provision I made within the Policing and Crime Bill. Um, and I would deplore any t uh, type of uh, behaviour that, that happens within our, within our society around this. Um, again, it has to be an executive-wide approach. You know, and I'm pleased to say that the Executive Office 
Office, um, under the, the, the leadership of the junior ministers, is having a particular focus around hate crime, and indeed I'm quite happy to support them in doing so. Um, and I, I think indeed this assembly, to an extent, um, well, in fact to a large extent, um, needs to be supporting those messages also. So um, yes, um, uh, of course, you know, I, I think that that's the approach we should be taking, and it's heartening to see we are making steps forward in that area. I call Air Michelle Gildrenew. Airim Sir Michelle Gildrenew. Um, would the Minister agree that a multifaceted approach is required to bring about an end to hate crime attacks on property owned by all sections of the community and that mutual respect for all cultural traditions is central to that? Yes, uh, entirely. You know, I, I think we all um, need to accept the fact that we're different and if anything that enriches our society and um, it's something that we should celebrate and respect with one another. Indeed it has to be a multifaceted approach. As I said it can't be just uh, within uh, my own department that we look at this when it gets to that um, unfortunately last end point of, of, of these types of offences and crimes. Um, but yes we, we very much need to start celebrating the diversity that, that you know exists within Northern Ireland and I'm quite happy to play my part in doing that also. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Firstly, declaring interest uh, as an officer in my local lodge and Larne district. But between 2011 and 2016, there have been uh, 132 attacks on Orange Halls. So, would the Minister accept that if there had been 132 attacks on synagogues, on GAA halls, on mosques, or particular denominations or chapels, that there would be a much stronger uh, cross departmental response? to address the causes of this sectarian hate tax attacks on Orange Halls and will she ensure the there's greater recognition that for what these are sectarian the hate time attacks? Um, and did I think any um, type of attack, whether it's an attack on an orange hall, whether it's an attack on a GAA, you know, is, is entirely deplorable. Um, uh, and certainly, um, I, I, I think the approach has been quite consistent, um, you know, from, from all members of this House around how we approach this particular area. You know, um, I, for one, you know, do not undermine the fact that, the, that these attacks are happening to orange halls, that we shouldn't have a, a, a very uh, serious approach in, on how we uh, tackle this. But um, indeed, um, it's um, um, operationally, it, it sits with the PSNI. Um, I've had these conversations with George around all uh, sorts of uh, hate crimes across Northern Ireland. But yes, every type of attack needs to be deplored, and I certainly wouldn't single one out over the other. It, it's, it's not acceptable, uh, Madam De uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And certainly, that's the message I would like to put out to this House. That anything like this, we should be we completely against. Aaron, Sir Trevor Lunn. I call Trevor Lunn. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, the, the statistic that Mr. Beggs just gave us is absolutely deplorable, uh, but it doesn't take away from the fact that there are many, many institutions being attacked in this country and many foreign nationals and, the and EU citizens. To his question. Yeah, I'm getting there. It, uh, can the minister give us absolute assurance that she will deal equally with, with, no matter who the institution is or who the person is, that they will all receive whatever measure of protection is available to you? Um, yes, there's no question about that. I'm, I'm quite happy to, to treat all these uh, such attacks um, equally. Um, er, every um, uh, incident like this, regardless of the nature of it, is deplorable, um, as the Minister has outlined. So yes, of course, un unquestionably. I call Jim Allister. Um, would the Minister agree that deterrent sentences are essential to stamp out this sectarian hate crime? But isn't the Department's commitment undermined by the fact that though there have been 132 attacks, the minister isn't interested enough to know how many prosecutions there have been. And as Mr. Begg said, if the I subject the member of attack has made, had been I think of a the member has colour, asked his question. I think the minister would have made it her business. Is that I not correct? I think the member has asked his question. Minister. Um, I, I think the member is entirely incorrect, um, and as the member will you know, know as much as anyone else, prosecution is a matter for the Public uh, uh, Prosecution Service. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm fully aware that the member for North Antrim has asked a number of questions around Orange Hall, and I can give my absolute assurance to this House that I do take these matters seriously, regardless if it's an Orange Hall, a GAA, or any other type of building within our community. Um, you know, as uh, another member has already outlined, these buildings are used by communities uh, from, from all various backgrounds. Um, um, we should be supporting our community and voluntary sector, um, and I completely, completely dismiss uh, claims that my approach to this would be any different should it be any other uh, type of building. I'm not, I'm not even sure where, where the member's getting that sort of suggestion from, um, but certainly I can put on record that that's not the case. I call Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question three. 
Uh, stalking and its impact on victims are matters of great concern. Such behaviour has no place in Northern Ireland, and I am clear that any such incident should be subject to the full rigour of the law. As I announced on the 12th of December, or sorry, September, my department is re reviewing the law in this area with a view of introducing specific stalking offences uh, um, legislation, and my officials briefed the Justice Com Committee last week on our initial work. The Justice Committee has indicated that it will carry out a review to consider the potential benefits of specific stalking legislation, and the Committee is committed to Bridges report by April next year to support legislative change. My department is working closely with the committee on this issue to ensure that legislation can follow on swiftly from the conclusion of this shared approach. Adrian McQuillan for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Um, I'm sure you'll agree with me, Minister, that Stockton's one of the worst cases of uh, harassment that can be that's out there. And the sooner we can bring forward legislation to stamp out and get the people who's actually carrying out before the courts, uh, the better. Um, yes, I, I, I do agree um, with, with, the, with the members' comments around uh, stalking. I've met with a number of victims of stalking, facilitated by actually members of his uh, party and indeed within my own constituency. People have come forward around how stalking is devastating their lives. Um, I'm not convinced that the, the current legislation is strong enough in this area, and I am mindful to look at legislation um, pending the outcome of the Justice Committee's uh, review in this area. And I'm pleased to say the Justice Committee are taking a really proactive approach, um, and I'll look forward to... to um, um, their report uh, early next year. Aaron, sir, Jerry Mullen. I call Jerry Mullen. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, can the Minister confirm uh, if she intends to publish a legislative programme for this mandate? Uh, and if so, when and in addition to legislation on coercive behaviour, what are your legislative uh, intentions? Um, I'm still developing my legislative program. Um, I'm quite keen through this mandate to have uh, focused pieces of legislation. Um, um, be hopeful that I would have around maybe three pieces of legislation this year, including uh, the, the piece of legislation around course of control, um, the domestic, uh, uh, domestic abuse offence that I had uh, committed in this House to, to uh, bring uh, to the statute books within a year. Um, we're, we're also looking at committal reform in terms of the, the parliament, parliamentary action plan. And uh, the third piece of legislation escapes me, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the member on that. Okay. Iram, sir, Michaela Boyle. I call Michaela Boyle. Um, Minister, can I thank you for your questions thus far? But under the current and existing law for harassment, um, Minister, would you have any uh, details on how many people have been uh, convicted and prosecuted for either harassment or stalking offences? Gormagut. I thank the, the member for her question. I don't have specific details um, to hand. I'm quite happy to, to write to the member with, uh, with, with those particular details. Um, I, I can generally talk about um, uh, people who have come to me um, around their comments of the current harassment law. I'm not quite sure it is fit for purpose, particularly in, in relation to stalking. Um, stalking takes on um, a very modern guise, particularly around social media, and I think it's an area that we need to look at. But again, you know, and as the member will be aware, as a member of the Justice Committee, I'd be quite keen to see the outcome of the Justice Committee's report to see how we can uh, best uh, tailor a piece of um, legislation in stocking uh, specific to Northern Ireland. I call Sandra Overend. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for outlining that her review should be complete by April, uh, April next year. Is the Minister aware of a, a, a cross-departmental gapping and mapping exercise that was headed up by OFM DFM during the last mandate? Uh, on internet safety that might also feed into her review on stalking and will the minister make a point of accessing that study? Um, I, I'm not specifically aware um, of the previous mandate's work, um, but indeed any um, work that's been not done up until this point you know, certainly um, uh, would be useful in, in any study moving forward around stalking legislation. Indeed, I've, I've asked my department officials to, to even look further afield than, the, than the, the jurisdictions of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland to see if there's any other innovative approaches that we can take to legislation in and around this area. But the member makes a good point, and as I, I, I alluded to uh, in respect to my answer of Ms Boyle, um, we do need to look um, at uh, how uh, the internet plays a role in stalking, particularly around social media. Um, it's something we're, um, we're all too familiar with and, and uh, we need to look at ways in how we can do it. And it will be difficult, um, particularly online and um, how that crosses into jurisdiction areas, but it, it is something my department will look at as part of the review and, I, and I'm sure the Justice Committee's review also. Aaron, sir, Claire Bailey. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister if during her work on this um, stalking legislation so far, um, she feels that the current harassment laws are, are fit for purpose or are they due to be reviewed and perhaps updated? Thank you. 
Um, I, I think in terms of developing any piece of legislation, we need to look at the current, legislative, or current legislation to see if it is fit for purpose in this particular area. Um, indeed, uh, stop, or the, the current harassment would be, um, you would uh, you'd be referenced to the current um, harassment legislation in and around stalking. Um, as I've uh, mentioned to other members, I'm not quite sure that the current harassment laws are fit for purpose um, in, in this area. Um, and indeed, I, I, I would imagine that we will move towards uh, specific stalking legislation um, but there's a lot of work to be done um, alongside the Justice Committee, as already alluded to. I call Gary Middleton. Four. My department provides 1.8 million in funding to victim support in Northern Ireland to ensure that all victims have the support they need within the criminal justice system. On the 5th of July 2016, I officially opened the Victim Support NI Foil Hub, which seeks to ensure that victims and witnesses of crime, including domestic violence, have access to support services as they engage within the criminal justice system. More specifically, as part of the Derry London Derry Special Court Listing Arrangements, my department has been working with statutory and voluntary partners to improve referral arrangements and support services for domestic uh, violence victims. The referral process from PSNI through Victim Support NI has been reviewed and work is ongoing to improve the timeliness of data transfer for domestic violence and abuse cases in the FOIL area. The protocol between Victim Support NI and Women's Aid is currently being revised to ensure that victims are advised of their respective services and can avail of these or be referred as necessary. PSNI, Men's Action Network and Men's Advisory Project will also be covered in the revised agreement. The intended installation of a second uh, remote link at the NSPCC's Londonderry office provides the opportunity to use the link specifically for domestic violence victims and witnesses on special domestic violence listing days. Officers within the local policing team in Derry City and Straban have been uh, provided with enhanced training around dealing with domestic abuse victims. And the Derry City and, uh, Derry City and Straban District Command Unit were the pilot district within the PSNI to obtain new body-worn video cameras for use by frontline officers following a £1.5 million investment by the PSNI. And the cameras have proven invaluable in the investigation of domestic-related incidents where many victims have historically been reluctant to provide a statement. Gary Middleton for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her very detailed response. Uh, the Minister mentioned the special court settings. Uh, can the Minister give her assessment of how uh, successful she feels that scheme is and whether she plans to extend it uh, right across the province? Um, I thank the member for his question. Um, I, I've been very impressed by the, the court listing arrangements around domestic violence um, in, the, in the dairy court system and indeed we're, we're going to enhance those arrangements around a perpetrator scheme, scheme to see um, how we can better, uh, uh, better uh, how we can make better use of this, this particular focus um, and then hopefully with, with the mind to roll it out across Northern Ireland. I call Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I ask the Minister to give a time frame for introducing legislation that mirrors Clare's law in England to address disclosure of domestic violence and sexual offences? Um, as part of the work that we're doing, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, or Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, um, around domestic violence, we're looking um, at a disclosure scheme as well as a domestic um, uh, abuse offence. Um, the, the domestic uh, abuse disclosure scheme, um, from my understanding, doesn't require specific legislation, perhaps require um, a special arrangements. Um, I don't have a specific timeline, and when we intend to introduce that, work is ongoing, but I'm, I'm quite happy to update the House when, uh, when we intend to introduce that. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her, her answers, in particular in response to, to Guy Middleton when you talked about the, you were impressed about the, what's called the Dairy Model. I'm just wondering, in, in relation to Women's Aid, and particularly their project One Safe Place, would you pledge your support for that if, if you are contacted by the Minister of Communities or the Department of Finance? <coughs> I, I thank the member for his uh, question. Did, did, uh, whilst in Derry, I, I did visit the particular one safe place that had been uh, um, uh, proposed by uh, Foil Women's Aid. I was indeed very much impressed by that, but I, I can confirm to the member that my department is working with uh, uh, Women's Aid and Foil to see how they can better uh, progress their, their business case um, with a mind to hopefully funding this particular uh, project. I call Kelly Armstrong. Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, with respect to the specialist domestic violence listings in Londonderry Court, um, and we've already mentioned it, but can you give um, any idea on when progress for similar listings in other courts will take place? 
Um, at this stage, we, we are looking at uh, uh, enhanced arrangements um, around a particular perpetrator program, um, and indeed uh, the Minister for Health and I um, visited uh, Women's Aid in Lisbon, and one of the areas that we talked about um, was the need to look at perpetrators in terms of tackling domestic violence. Um, the nature of this type of abuse is that it's domestic, and very often victims you know, will be reluctant to come forward because they don't want to get their partner, the father of their child, in trouble, for example. Um, so we're looking at a perpetrator program that could perhaps provide another opportunity to address this, this uh, type of offence um, before we intend to roll out across Northern Ireland. But the theme of problem-solving justice is something that will thread through my entire uh, work programme within the Department of Justice. Um, I think it's a good common sense approach on how we deal with this, um, and it, it ensures the best service for, for, for the people that, that we intend to serve. I call Rosemary Barton. Question five. Um, I have regular meetings with the Chief Constable and discuss a broad range of issues. Um, however, I have not had any discussions with him on this specific issue, but I have been advised that work is progressing well to implement the recommendations of the review of the Police Training College with a view to commencing student, student officer intakes in January 2017. A number of recommendations have already been implemented, such as the cessation of punitive methods, marching to and from classes, and the removal of the compulsory residential requirement of the training. The dedicated implementation team has continued its work to address the, uh, the remaining recommendations. The PSNI are due to provide an update on progress in this respect to the policing board later this week. As a provisional measure, I'm aware that the PSNI have also taken steps to notify potential candidates of their intention to recommence student intakes to the policing college in January 2017. This is, however, subject to approval by the policing board. While I cannot comment definitively on the resumption of student intakes, I fully recognise that the Policing Board is seeking assurance that the necessary arrangements are in place before indicating its support for the uh, recommencement. I am confident that the PSNI and the Policing Board are working together with a view to full implementation of the recommendations as soon as possible. Rosemary Barton for a supplementary. Thank you. Will the Minister give a commitment today that the shortfall in trained and operational officers will not be used as a reason for further budget cuts to be imposed on the PSNI. Um, I, indeed, I, I, I think uh, within the executive, we, we are all keen to protect our budgets, but I think we do have to be mi uh, mindful of the current climate around particular cuts. Um, the protection of the PSNI from a 2% cut is helping to ensure that frontline policing can be protected as far as possible, and I am currently content that the PSNI does have sufficient resourcing to meet the demands placed upon it. Aram, sir, Declan Kearney. I call Declan Kearney. Uh, I wanted to ask the Minister about the discontinuation of punitive and uh, militaristic training of PSNA recruits at Garnerville, but I feel that she's, uh, she's adequately answered the question already. Thank you. Okay, Gurumagat. Uh, Sir, Sinead Bradley. I call Sinead Bradley. Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, could the Minister um, confirm whether she is supportive of the patent threshold of 7,500 full-time police officers, and has she committed to putting that central to any budgetary uh, uh, priorities going forward, and what timeline would she hope to achieve that within? I ask members to, to note it's one question. <laughs> um, I, in terms of the patent report, I think we need to be very mindful in terms of uh, you know, um, uh, how appropriate it was 15 years ago in, in terms of uh, police reform within Northern Ireland. Um, I think a lot of the, the arrangements within patent are still quite applicable to today. And indeed, in my answer to uh, Ms Barton, I do believe that the 2% the, the uh, 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 ring fence around the police um, ensures that the police do have sufficient resources in terms of the numbers that they need to meet their operational needs. I call Alex Easton. Uh, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker. In 2013, there were 94 assaults on prison officers on duty in prison establishments in Northern Ireland. In 2014, there were 105 assaults recorded. In 2015, there were 100 assaults, uh, assaults recorded. And up until the end of October this year, there have been 58 assaults on staff. From an operational perspective, the Northern Ireland Prison Service have found that the greatest contributing factor in respect of assaults is crowding. The use of accommodation is kept on a regular view and the prison population is dynamically managed in this respect. Additionally, the prison service is evaluating the effectiveness of body-worn cameras for prison staff to prevent violence and assist in the management of disruptive prisoners. And I had asked the prison service to explore the feasibility of, deploy of deploying these cameras more widely to deter violent or disruptive prisoners. 
and recently body-worn cameras have been deployed in the care and supervision unit to record interactions with particular prison prisoners held there. And Alex Easton for a very quick supplementary. Okay. Um, thank the Minister for answer so far. And I'm sure the Minister would agree with me that any attacks on prison, prison officers are totally unacceptable. Could I ask the Minister what facilities or support are on offer to prison officers who have been assaulted? And an even quicker answer from sure. the Minister. Um, I, I'm very mindful of that any attack on um, any uh, frontline member of staff, particularly our, our, our particular prisoners of service, because it falls within my remit, is, is entirely deplorable. Um, I'm keen to ensure that there are support services in place, um, and alongside uh, the, the pay review uh, with the prison service, I, I recently announced that I would extend the PRRT to, to prison, serve, uh, prison officers, both uh, serving and retired officers, and I do feel that that will be a significant support um, in terms of helping them uh, deal with the, with the difficulties around their job. Thank you and thanks to everyone for being so brief. Shinjara Leshanam, the question and list Dolce. That ends the period for listed questions and we will now move on to topical questions and I call Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister of Justice to outline what provisions have been made to prepare for industrial action by prison officers? Um, we've had close uh, conversations with the Prison Officers Association around uh, the, the recent pay review. Um, unfortunately, the, the POA has not accepted the, 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 the the, the increase that we had negotiated on their behalf, um, but we continue negotiations around that. Um, regrettably, if we should move towards industrial relations, um, I'm quite content that we have the uh, appropriate uh, contingency arrangements in place to, to, mitig to mitigate any significant uh, service problem within the prison. However, as I said, negotiations are continuing, and I'm pleased that uh, uh, Mr. Aiken's colleagues have facilitated some of the conversations around that, and I do appreciate that, but um, we're still working towards a more positive outcome. Steve Aiken for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, and thank you, my Minister, for our, uh, our comments so far. Uh, do you think the Department and the Prison Service Management Board have been disingenuous by saying that the Northern Ireland Prison Service have been offered a 2.6% pay rise, when 1.6% of that figure is in relation to risk alliance? Um, what I will say is that um, I was quite keen to stress to the Finance Minister about um, including the, statutory, or the, the supplementary risk alliance um, in respect of prison officers because I do believe it reflects the very challenging job that they have. Um, however, we were constrained about the public sector pay policy and I think we need to be mindful of that. Um, I'm quite pleased to say that I ne uh, negotiated probably the best pay award uh, throughout the public sector in, in respect of prison officers. Um, I appreciate it. It's not what the, the Prison Officers Association had wanted for their members, um, but I continue to be very mindful on how we can best support them and I, I'm content that, that we got the best deal for them. I call Jim Wells. Uh, could the Minister outline the average cost of housing a prisoner in a prison in Northern Ireland and how that compares with the rest, like the equivalent cost in the rest of the United Kingdom? Uh, if the uh, principal deputy speaker will indulge me, I, I will respond to Mr. Wells in, in the prepared response. Um, so, uh, while the costs are not directly comparable, the average uh, annual cost of keeping an offender in prison in Northern Ireland was uh, 57,643. Uh, NOM service for England and Wales was 35,182, and Scottish prison service uh, 34,399 for the same year. Um, the Northern Ireland prison serve cost per prisoner place is higher than the rest of the UK, as the same range of services uh, must be provided with within a relatively small prison population, uh, population and therefore economies of scale lead to higher costs in Northern, Ar Northern Ireland. I call Jim Wells for a supplementary. Well, th those figures are quite shocking because what they're indicating is it costs 40% more to house a prisoner in Northern Ireland than it does in Scotland, where again the economies of scale issue Can the member come to his question, prevail. please? Uh, would the minister outline what plans she has to bring that figure down to the UK average? Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I don't believe that the costs are directly comparable. Um, I think uh, Northern Ireland is, is um, quite different in terms of the, the challenges we face, uh, namely around the, the paramilitary uh, uh, prisoners and, and the, the, the extra costs um, in relation to that. Um, in terms of uh, an outline business case um, around the, the prison estate, I think when we get those in place, we will start to see more savings um, and also uh, uh, a safer prison in terms of, of, of sight lines and the, the other areas outlined with, within those outline business cases. Work is ongoing um, and um, hopefully we can bring that figure down, but I don't believe it's a fair comparison with other parts of the United Kingdom. I call Trevor Clark. 
very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, I mean, there's been much in the media recently over the very unfortunate deaths of many of the prisoners uh, through suicide. But what work her department is doing in relation to supporting the prison officers who have been at the coal face of many of those harrowing deaths? Um, yes, and I think any death in custody is, is an absolute tragedy, and I extend my sympathies to the families of, of the two most recent deaths um, that have happened uh, within McGabry Prison. Um, indeed, the, the impact is also on prison staff, and I do think we need to be mindful of that. Um, and uh, the, the appropriate supports um, uh, that are currently in place have been offered to those uh, prison officers. Um, as mentioned in an, in an earlier answer, um, I'm really mindful of the challenges that prison officers, particularly in Northern Ireland, face um, in their role, which is why I was keen to find a way that we could better support them. So I'm really pleased to say that we have extended the, the Police Rehabilitation and Retraining Trust to both serving and retired prison officers. Um, it's a fantastic um, service if, if, if you can ever get the opportunity to visit. Um, they, they provide a range of services um, around mental and physical health, um, and I really look forward to, to seeing how that can better facilitate uh, prison officers, as I said, both retired and in service. Trevor Clark for supplementary. And can I thank the Minister for that answer? Can I ask the Minister, does she believe that the media are balanced in terms of the reporting whenever these deaths take place? And do they take into consideration the difficulties that the prison officers have, the conditions they work under, and actually the mental health of the prison, prison officers themselves, given the, the conditions they actually work under? Question. I think um, in terms of any story that seems to come out of my prisons, um, I, I'm not quite sure there's balanced reporting and there's been a number of reports in the press which have been uh, widely exaggerated or just to some uh, extent untrue. Um, indeed, I, I don't think um, we... Uh, we, we, we appropriately estimate the challenges that prison officers face. Um, I, I do think that Northern Ireland in particular is a challenging environment because of our, our specific issues over here. Um, and I, I'm quite keen to stress that we need to support prison officers. Um, and that in turn, I believe, will, will lead to better uh, uh, support and care of prisoners within their custody. So it, it's a message that I think we need, we need to have that balance. Um, and indeed, I will try and find ways to do that for both prisoners and prison officers. Question four has been withdrawn. I call Michelle Gildrenew. Um, can I ask the Minister what consideration has been given to rethinking how and when court buildings and staff and facilities are being used to improve the service and to ensure sustainability of local court and justice services, please? Um, I think in uh, one aspect of, of uh, uh, justice system that we need to be mindful of, particularly as a public service, is access to justice. Um, uh, the member will be aware that I announced a, a review of courts uh, across Northern Ireland. Part of that thinking is how we could better utilise courthouses. Um, uh, as mentioned in an earlier answer, um, one of the, the, the threads of delivery that I intend to uh, take through um, my programme of work in the Justice Department is problem-solving justice. We are piloting an addiction court uh, in Northern Ireland. Ireland. Um, we're going to look at other areas, perhaps through mental health. Um, um, we've talked about the, the domestic violence uh, court arrangement. Perhaps we could look at our court services in terms of that. Um, I meet regularly with the Lord Chief Justice, um, um, and he's keen to see how we can better utilise the various courts around Northern Ireland. But ultimately, at the heart of this, this has to be about access to justice. Ultimately, I would like to see less uh, cases going into court, which is why I think a problem-solving justice approach is, there, is, is the right approach to take. Michelle Gildren, you for a supplement. I welcome the Minister's answer and I uh, agree with her that it is about access to justice and I welcome her announcement earlier this year about uh, keeping that local access to justice. The I wonder, would the question? Minister give serious consideration to restoring coroner's courts, industrial courts, family proceeding courts, etc., to uh, local courthouses as well instead of uh, centralising these functions? <laughs> I think um, my justice review will take a wide look at how we um, uh, service access to justice right throughout Northern Ireland and within communities. Uh, the member makes particular reference around family courts, essentially is if there's perhaps even a mediation so that we're not necessarily going to courts because we all know how traumatic, traumatic it is for families in, in respect of these particular cases. It will, it will form part of a wider review um, which uh, courts and, and the buildings uh, that courts are currently held in you know, uh, will, will take into account. But yes, I, I I think we need to take um, a realistic look at how we're providing uh, court services in, in a modern 2017. I call Pam Cameron. So, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister to outline uh, what her role has been in the White Ribbon campaign this year? 
Um, I thank the member for her question. Indeed, we will be hosting an event in the Long Gallery this evening, which I would encourage every member to attend. Um, um, the Minister for Health and I actually were in Lisburn this morning at a, a women's uh, aid refuge centre. And one of the key messages, and I see a lot of gentlemen in this chamber, so I'm going to make the point, is that we really need to take ownership um, of domestic abuse and violence that's happening within our society. And it's not for the case uh, of, of paying lip service to. Um, domestic violence in itself is a deplorable um, act of abuse against individual citizens, um, but it has such wider implications for wider society. We're finding um, that people that come into the criminal justice system, for example, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, have had some incidents of trauma, and in a lot of cases that trauma tends to be domestic violence. So if we, if we can tackle domestic violence in itself, then I think we can go a long way into tackling, tackling wider societal problems, including uh, mental health issues, uh, addiction issues, uh, the, the, the triangle um, they told me it was, it was the three areas together that seemed to have um, seemed to be quite serious implications of domestic violence. We currently are in the 16 days of action, so if there is anything that members can do, whether it's through their social media, whether it's just having conversations, just raising the debate, we need to talk more about the, the, the scourge that's happening within society. It doesn't discriminate. If you think it's not happening in your area, I can assure you it is, and um, it's a message that we need to get out there as much as possible. Thank you. Pam Cameron for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for that very thorough answer. Um, and she will be well aware that the, the pledge for the White Ribbon campaign is never to commit, condone or stay silent about domestic violence against women. And can the Minister, um, well, will the Minister agree with me that it is for each one of us here and in wider society to make it socially completely and utterly unacceptable for anyone to commit domestic violence? Yes. Um, domestic violence and domestic abuse. Um, members in this House will be aware of my commitment to, to bring um, legislation within a year around a uh, course of control of domestic violence uh, uh, offence to the statute books. But again, just to reiterate that message, everyone, uh, every person in this, in this House, in this chamber today, um, has a responsibility to ensure that they don't let this happen. Um, you know, we, we hear often about who's to blame, who's not to blame. You know, this is a case where if we don't do something about it, then to an extent we're, we're guilty too. So if I can encourage every member when they leave this chamber today to go out and do um, some act uh, within the 16 days of action to, to raise the issue of domestic violence within the communities, um, it, it's, it's incredible that, that the lives that you might save in doing so. So if I can appeal to that, Mr. Principal Deputy. I, called Har I call Harold McKee. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister state any guidance that members of the Policing Board have been given reference in lobbying for funding for armed length bodies? Um, I, I'm not aware of what the, the, the um, uh, member alludes to. The Policing Board, uh, board is independent um, of my department. Um, I do have an interest in the area, but I, I'm not aware of the comments that the member alludes to. And the member uh, uh, supplementary for Harold McKee. Thank you, Minister. Would the Minister agree that good governance and transparency in all who hold positions of authority on boards is paramount to the trust that the people of Northern Ireland have in them? Um, entirely, yes. Um, um, of course, good governance is the essence of good public service. So, um, yes, I, I entirely agree with those comments. I called Sidney Anderson. Uh, can I ask the Minister to outline what action is being taken to address the prevalence of drugs in our prisons? I thank the, the member for his question. Drugs is an issue within our prisons, particularly psychoactive substances. Um, it, it's difficult to, to mitigate uh, drugs coming in and out of our prisons. Um, another area of concern is also prescribed drugs coming uh, into prisons and being taken, taken illicitly. Um, we do keep a regular um, a review on drugs coming in and out of prison. Um, th there is a sense of... Uh, uh, the effects of drugs that are happening within prison, but it, it, it is difficult. It's disproportionate within prisons as well, but it is something we're having a focus on. Um, and it's something generally I think we need to have a wider focus, focus on society. It contributes to a lot of localised crime, um, particularly um, some of the work that we're doing through the paramilitary uh, panel report suggests that drugs um, is, is quite prevalent within communities and, and it's being pushed through those means. So if, if you know, I can encourage members, if, if there's anything that they would suggest, I'm quite happy to hear come forward. But I, again, I think this has been a Northern Ireland executive-wide approach to this, indeed a Northern Ireland Assembly approach. 
Sydney Anderson for a supplementary. I thank you and I thank the Minister for her answer. The recently pub uh, published report on the announced visit to HMP McGarvey in September 16 noted no significant progress had been made in addressing the concerns and abuse of drugs raised in May 15 and, and restated the in January come to his 16. Question, please. Minister, would you agree with me that the drugs issue is too serious a matter not to be dealt with? And do, how do you and what do you propose to do to eradicate the scourge of drugs within our prisons? Um, of course, I agree that it's, um, it's too serious an issue not to be dealt with, um, and it is something that I do have a keen focus on. Um, and indeed, the, um, I, I take um, a, a lot of reference from that particular report. But again, as I said, it's, um, it's concentrated within prisons, which does tend to be a reflection of wider society. So it's not just what um, we could do within prisons, but it's also what we need to do within wider society. I've had conversations with the First Minister and Deputy First Minister around this particular area. I think it's something that we need to address more widely, um, and um, I do have a keen focus on it. I call Jenny Palmer. I move on to questions.